Okay, on this slide, we are going to talk about formaldehyde. Now, formaldehyde, um, uh, the, the molecular output is shown at the bottom of the slide. And if you remember, we said that this is going to have 10 atomic orbitals, therefore 10 molecular orbitals. We're going to have 12 electrons. And so this gives us a, a lens through which we can look at our output. So we do indeed have, for our molecular output, we have 10 outputs um, based on the 10 molecular orbitals that went into the calculation. I'm sorry, 10 atomic orbitals that went into the calculation. And if we look down here, we can see um, this is what we call the HOMO, and this is the LUMO. Um, 12 electrons will fill up six orbitals, and so that makes this the HOMO and the LUMO. Now, when we did this with ethylene, the HOMO and the LUMO both were some type of pi bond orbital, either a pi or pi star. That's not true in formaldehyde. It is kind of interesting. So the LUMO, look, we have coefficients in a lot of different orbitals. Well, that's kind of weird. However, in the LUMO, where are our coefficients? They are in just two orbitals. So what do those correspond to? They could correspond to the PX on oxygen and AO number two, the PX on our carbon. So let's, let's write that out for our LUMO. Our LUMO is a P orbital on carbon and a P orbital on oxygen. So here's our carbon and here's our oxygen. And notice that the carbon is negative. Whoops, uh-oh, things are moving. Look out. Uh, the carbon is negative. I need to fix that. I don't think I can. Uh, the carbon is negative compared to the oxygen, which is a positive value. So we're going to have to write these opposite and one other big tricky thing, and I sort of covered it up like a jerk, but that's minus 0.8. The values of those numbers are different. This carbon orbital should be drawn a little bit bigger than the oxygen. So carbon is flipped over compared to oxygen. That's our Lua, LUMO. This is the pi star. <coughs> Okay, so let's, we'll, we're going to talk about two different things. One, we're going to talk about what we would think of the reactivity of formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is a weak electrophile. And so if we were to take formaldehyde and attack it with a nucleophile, think of a Grignard reagent or some strong carbanion, it would attack, and where would it attack? It would attack at carbon. And we break that pi bond. So, as a nucleophile, the nucleophile is electron rich, it's going to react with its, through its HOMO, but the electrophile is going to react through its LUMO. Well, what does the LUMO of formaldehyde looks like, look like? It looks like what we've drawn here. And furthermore, where is the biggest chunk of the LUMO? The orbital that contributes the most is the PX on carbon. So, no surprise, that's where the nucleophile attacks. This nucleophile dumps its electrons into the biggest part of that orbital it can find. And the carbon piece is bigger than the oxygen piece. So, that's where it attacks. So, the, so the magnitude of these numbers is important. Don't worry about the mathematical sign, but you do worry about the magnitude. So, our nucleophile will actually attack at the carbon side of the pi star, not the oxygen side. Okay, great. That's kind of interesting. Now, if we were to react formaldehyde with um, something that's electron deficient, like an acid, where would we protonate formaldehyde? Well, we ought to protonate it at the HOMO. The highest occupied molecular orbital is where the protonation ought to occur. Where is that site in the molecule? It's one of these lone pairs on oxygen. So let's take a look down at our HOMO in our output and see where the coefficient is biggest. And if we look down, okay, we have some uh, information here that's on the carbon. There's an, That carbon also has some, can't drive me crazy, um, that hydrogen. But our biggest number in that column is 0.77. And what does that correspond to? The PY on oxygen. The oxygen is going to pick up this proton. 
And you know, we didn't need to have molecular orbital output to figure that out, but that's totally consistent with what we would normally see just based on what we know about chemical reactivity. So all these computational outputs tell us exactly how the molecule will behave, and the good news is it's totally consistent to our less sophisticated non-computational methods that we've developed in our course.